Curve here with another falconry video. Today's video, I'm going to be introducing Oplomato falcons. It's a very exciting species and a very striking bird in appearance. And this was a, this one won't be too long, but I want to go a little bit about the natural history and then go a little bit about into them as a falconry bird. I'm hoping to have a couple of other videos on Oplomato falcons that'll go more into some very unique history that we don't normally talk about. But this is a bird that I was introduced to in field guides, not falconry books. Remember, I grew up before the internet when we couldn't talk to falconers around the world and we're just, what do you have in your library? And looking through the old books, I'd read, what are the falcons of North America? And I remember some of these old books, it's like North America, they were talking about the United States when really that's Canada, United States and Mexico. But North America, it's like we have the American Kestrel, we have Merlin falcons, and then we have prairie falcons, peregrines, and jeer falcons. And, but there was one other that was like, ooh, there's this very rare falcon, ooh. And you'd see the pictures, and they were so striking. And it was, uh, here's this Oplomato falcon, what is it? And I remember thinking how unique it looked. The Maller stripe area was much more defined than any other falcon, other than maybe like the Egyptian lantern falcons, where it's like, eh, eh. it's like, geez, that's a good looking bird. And that red on the lower chest, sort of wide up here, and a long tail, super long tail and oversized wings. And they looked almost like, you know, falcons are like a brick. Most big falcons are like, they're solid. And it looked like you took a falcon and just stretched it. The whole thing, everything, everything about it. But there wasn't much about it. It's And it's like, I never saw one in the falconry community. I lived in Utah. This is back in the day. And I just thought these are these weird, rare falcons that are, you know, southern Texas, southern Arizona, and extremely rare. And uh, turns out they're not rare at all. They're extremely common and they're not a United States bird. They live in South America, Central America, Mexico, and barely, barely, barely the northern edge of their range. The, the frontier that they push is Southern Arizona and Southern Texas. Now this gets kind of interesting because um, in, in, in more modern days, then there has been a view by the United States government, they are an endangered species, they need our protection, let's work and breed them and release them into the wild and bolster their populations in Arizona and Texas. And even though I applaud those kind of efforts, uh, there are people who said, but they're not an endangered species. And they're like, well, we consider the northern population to be its own subspecies. They're a little different in size, the coloration is different, and so we will call this subspecies an endangered species and we'll offer protection and offer extra help uh, breeding them and bolstering their numbers. It's like, okay. And there are people, and I'll, I'll go into this more in another video, who said, well, let's import the southern subspecies, Peruvian opomatos, to the United States and start captive breeding them so they can be available for educational programs, for zoos, for aviaries, and falconers. And that is what's happened. The in the wild, when you get down to the range, like if you're in Mexico, Guatemala, and you see, oh, you see them and they're, they're just, they're more colorful than our northern birds. The northern uh, ones typically have white on top. The southern Oplomato is just orange everywhere. And there's a couple of other extremely orange falcons you see down in Mesoamerica. The orange-breasted falcon, which is about the size of a, you know, medium peregrine, but with much bigger feet for grabbing parrots out of the trees. And the bat falcon, which is a Kestrel to Merlin size, typically uh, very similar in colors and very similar in patterns to the Oplomato. And I think it's easy to just be like, oh, yep, that's those three. You got Bat Falcon, Oplomato, Orange Breasted. They must all be cousins. Well, the Bat Falcon and the Orange Breasted are closely related, but gene sequencing has revealed that no, the Oplomato is not closely related to them at all. Um, its actual closest relative is on the other side of the world, the New Zealand Falcon. How'd that happen? No clue. Uh, but they are. And the more you look at them, the more it's like, oh, I see. Almost every bird in New Zealand ends up becoming kind of this greenish, brownish color to blend in with the overly green landscape of New Zealand. And there's something strange about equatorial falcons. I don't know what it is, but if you get closer and closer to that equatorial band, you see falcons get orange. 
you know, I mentioned on our side of the world, Apple Mottos, Bat Falcons, uh, and Orange Breast Falcons. And on the other side of the world for me, over in the old world, you have Tata Falcons, you have um, B uh, Barberry Falcons, and the Red Nape Shaheen Peregrine, a Peregrine that got super orange. So that kind of makes sense because those three over there, you could be like, well, they live in desert landscapes. True, but then why do you have these tropical falcons? Why orange stands out if you're in a, in a green rainforest? Why would you? But they have. So for whatever reason, which came first, the Aplomato or the New Zealand falcon? Who knows? But talking with uh, people in New Zealand, people who've worked with uh, uh, New Zealand falcons and trained them, and also reading up the accounts of other falconers who have had captive bred ones in Europe and in the United States, it's like, oh yeah. All the good and the bad of a New Zealand falcon is almost identical to an Aplomato. So really kind of an interesting history where it's like, don't know which one came from where, but that is their closest relative. And it's different. It's very different. Like you look at the tail of an Aplomato falcon and it's, it's, it's not stripes. It's big, huge bands. And by size, an Aplomato is very similar in, in size and weight to a Cooper's Hawk. Of course, the dimensions are different, but the lifestyle is also much closer to that of an occipiter. We normally think of big falcons as needing open country. We go fly them out. We're like, oh, I don't want any trees. I don't want any phone poles or power lines. What's the most open country we can find to fly a big falcon? That works best for them because a big falcon has stiff, plasticky feathers and they want to dive. And they want feathers with low wind resistance that are stiff and plasticky and they can build momentum and knock a bird out of the sky where cooper's hawks are like nee, 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 chasing oh i'm chasing a bird a quail or whatever and if it goes into the brush fine i'll go into it where most big falcons if you were hunting a partridge and the partridge goes into the brush then that peregrine's gonna go and and just go past it doesn't want to risk damaging in any way. Aplomatos don't do that. Aplomatos are just like a Cooper's Hawk. They'll, ooh, we're gonna chase, 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 level flight, it doesn't matter, we're gonna go up, down, through, around, hunting in the brush, in the scrubby forest, in the rainforest, and wherever, and catch their prey. Now, they'll hunt prey as small at, well, in falconry, I'll get into that in a second, but they're basically bird hunters. They'll hunt insects, they will hunt in, you know, uh, lizards and snakes too, but basically, they're bird hunters. It's what they're built to do. And they've got nice long toes, that are good for catching that but again much longer legs than one would expect for a falcon these birds are again south america central america mexico and barely into the united states that's a diverse range of habitat that they've been able to colonize and successfully learn how to hunt but one very unique thing about them that adds to their success is they'll in most regions pair up and stay paired up and hunt together they like company they're a social falcon. Not to the level of, say, a Harris hawk that, oh, we've we got a whole pack. We're going to hunt together. But similar. Very similar. And and that gives them more success. You know, it's like, where are you? Oh, where are you? Okay. Oh, you flush something? I'll catch it. Oh, now you flush something? Oh, I'll catch it. And it's just dinking around, having a good old time as a mated pair. Almost usually year-round in most cases. This is unique among falcons. If you are thinking of getting one, you need to factor that in because this is a social bird where most falcons are kind of antisocial and you're like, ah, they're out in the mew and then I take the hood off and then they go up in the sky and they're up there and you're not as with each other as much. A an Apomato is going to thrive the more social you are with it, the more social time it has, the more it's like, hey, we're an us. Not, not to the level of a, of a, of like a parrot, but think that kind of mentality. A parrot is a happier parrot if it's with the family all the time. Same thing with an Apomato. Keep them around you. Don't just have them out in the mew relaxing like a normal falcon would enjoy. In falconry, typically what is um, available in the United States is the Southern, the Peruvian Apomato, which again is more colorful. Uh, and typically you have a chamber raised bird, but you can also do an imprint. So talking about some of the hunting and some of the good and the bad of Aplomato falcons, one of the most notable bad things is, as a general rule, they're horrible at hooding. Now they can be trained to hood. There's many articles that have been written that you can find online about high level tidbitting where you, here is the hood and they go, and you put it down, give them a piece of meat, hold it up again, click or whistle, 
and then give them a piece of meat. So there's this association with any time the food hood comes on or off, I get a little snack, a little reward. That can work. I've done it. But in general, it's, it's, a, it's an accurate statement to say, in general, Aplomatos do not lend themselves to the hood well, which is amazing because there are other falcon species that it's like, hey, you can trap a wild one and put the hood on no problem. And from day one, it's like a piece of cake. And they're like, okay, sure, not Aplomatos. The nice thing is, is the flip side is they're very social and not as reactive in the ways that other big falcons are. If you put a, most big falcons, you take a peregrine or a jeer, put them on a perch next to you in a car or in the back, and they see things going past the window, they're like, Bleh! they're freaking out and they, they hate that. Uh, Apomatos are more like a hawk, especially like a Harris hawk, where, hey, you put them on a perch next to you, and they're just like, hey, we're go we're having fun. We're going out hunting together. I like this, all right. A lot of people put them, let them ride on their back rest of their chair. You know, they're just sitting on the seat next to you on the actual chair. Uh, that works. And so they're they're much more social in that way. I don't know that they think you are their mate in that instance where I talked about two mates going together. But again, their mindset is I should have a hunting partner and we should be being a we. Where a falcon, you know... A big falcon, normally it's almost like, okay, this is my trained bird. It's hooded. It doesn't know where we're going. And it is, my, I am the falconer and I trained it. And then that flips, you take off the hood and they launch into the heavens. And now I am their humble flushing dog as they circle above waiting for me to flush. But, you know, And it's kind of like that. Think the mentality, if you're going to have success with an Aplomato, of like, we're a wee. Help get them in on the game. Get them understanding what you're doing, what you're trying to go after, the lay of the land, that kind of thing. And so a lot of people do have them ride side saddle, uh, which is what I've done with a lot of my Harris Hawks and a lot of my Cooper's Hawks. I just have them and they're like, what's going on? Okay, looking out the window and unhooded, you know, tethered, but unhooded. You will have typically more success that way. Hunting is a pair. A lot of people have had extreme success doing that flying to Apomatos. They get them together and they raise them together. They train them to come to the Lord together and they hunt them together. In this way, a lot of people have really pushed the limits of what they can do. Normally, you know, sparrow and starling sized prey is normal for, for an Apomato. Quail, are, are, was, that was always my favorite. Quail doves and pigeons, that was my favorite prey to hunt with them. And, um, but... Partridge, of course, is also doable, but people hunting with pears have been able to successfully go after pheasants with regularity. And I know some people have done that with an individual female as well, but uh, it's quite common for those hunting a pair of Apomatos to be able to hunt and take down pheasants, which is very impressive because a pheasant is substantially larger than they are. Uh, as far as the flight style, some people do from a fist, some people hunt them from a tea perch, much like a hawk, which is Again, just weird for a falcon, but hey, if it works, it works. And some people also, very similar to a hawk or an eagle, set them free in juniper tree country and just have them follow along tree to tree to tree. And that is, at a, whatever you flush up, they go after. That works good. That's very similar to what they would do in the wild. So remember, so no hooding. You can ho tra hood trainer, but I'm saying just remember as a general rule, they're not very good at it. You got to be able to work around that. When you see an Apomato in flight, it's very unusual because they are buoyant. They're, like I said, they're like a falcon stretched out. When you see a really broad-winged bird, like an eagle, a condor, a vulture, they have these deep broad wings. Um, and that, you can see, okay, there's more lift, they can glide and soar. When you see a Sipiters, like a goshawk or a Cooper's hawk, their wings are short, but even deeper, super deeper. But they, but they, but they're they're not buoyant, but they can stay up. Apomatos are kind of like a seagull. You see, uh, any gull, the wings are so oversized. They're narrow, but they're so oversized that they just they kind of float. Apomatos can fly very fast, but they're extremely buoyant and they can float. And then with that ridiculously long tail as well, that's a combination that even though the wing shape is nothing like an occipiter, the flight style is very similar to an occipiter. With a <laughs> and again, they will crash into the brush where other big falcons won't, which again is very much like a cooper's hawk. 
One of the reasons that uh, they are used prevalently in the United States is for depredation. Depredation is when you'll have, for example, a farmer has a farm, whether maybe it's a wine vineyard or a blueberry farm, and uh, songbirds come in. Maybe you have starlings, blackbirds, sparrows, and flocks of thousands coming in, just destroying your crops. And you, you know you want to shoot them. That doesn't do much good. And so they farmers will hire and contract with falconers to have a depredation contract where you can come in and say, hey, I'm going to chase away these birds every day during the certain season with a bird of prey. And different species have been used over the years, but aplomatos have proven to be perfect for this. And there's a few reasons why. Uh, first of all, falconry is a fall and winter sport. That you know, in the summertime we molt our birds and it's, they're, they're fat, they're hot, they're like, I don't want to do anything, I'm hot but an Appomato can handle the heat. Uh, also, Appomatos are not as motivated by food and weight management, which is very frustrating with a normal hunt, but very good uh, in, in a depredation setting. So here's what I mean by that. Take, take like a red-tailed hawk. They, they wanna just kinda sit. You call them to a lure, you call them near fist, or they go after and they successfully catch something. But if they miss too many times, they're gonna get moody and wanna just land somewhere and or else expect you to give them some sort of a reward. It's like, it's prey, predator, prey, drive. I wanna, I wanna either conserve energy or I want to hunt, give me food. And otherwise, if I've done that, I just want, that's not Appomatos. Appomatos are, they're almost fun loving. They, they're like, oh, we're dinking around. We, what are we doing? Uh, I have one of my friends who was doing depredation work, and he, he was saying how, yeah, they'd be at the correct weight, but they'd be on the other end of the vineyard and didn't want to come back. And so he'd be like, huh? He'd just start walking away and start throwing a tennis ball in the air instead of the lure and start throwing sticks up and throwing them in the brush. And the operator's like, wait, what's he doing? Is he having fun without me? And they'd come over like, oh, go and investigate. That's good for depredation because if if you have a bird that dives in, catches one of those birds eating the grapes or eating the blueberries, and it might be done. It's like, I'm done. I got my food. You want a bird that'll chase and haze and have fun, and that's what Appomatos do. They'll just dink around, especially if you have more than one flying together. So this may their their ability to dink around and not be just prey driven and have fun. And the fact that they can handle the heat so well and can be flown spring, summer, fall, you know, early fall when normally our birds are molting makes them a very good choice for depredation. And we're seeing more and more in the United States and Canada, they're increasing use in that way. But overall, they're a difficult bird to train and fly. Not ridiculously difficult, but there's thousands of years of history training falcons big falcons especially, it's cut and dry. Even though there's always new innovations with training techniques, it's cut and dry to get a big falcon up and going. And Appomatos are so different that if you project onto them the preconceptions of the mind of, say, a peregrine falcon or a jeer falcon, you're just gonna be pulling your hair out the entire time. You're gonna be frustrated nonstop. So if you are considering flying an Appomato, just remember you're gonna have challenges that you're not expecting. The bird probably won't hood really well. Sometimes it will test your patience in ways that other falcons don't. But just go into it with an open mind and say, this bird is like a uh, insane hybrid between a falcon, a Harris hawk, a Cooper's hawk, and a dog, and a parrot. <laughs> All amalgamated into one organism. And just accept that. Fly them for what they are, and you'll have a lot of success with them. They are wonderful birds. They're beautiful birds, and they're a thrill to fly and work with. Very different, but very fun. I hope you found this video uh, just a brief introduction of use, and I will have a couple of other videos coming out soon on them going on some of the history that we don't normally go into that should be a lot of fun. But as always, uh, please let me know in the comments um, any other videos you'd like to see, any questions you have. I get to them the best I can. And if you would like to also share some of your experiences on Appomatos down below, feel free. There's a wealth of information on the internet about them. So again, this is just a quick introduction. And let me know what other videos you would like to see. And as always, happy hawking.